Do you know that depending on where you hit, it does different things? What do you mean? Does it? Like the only thing I know is up at the top, it loops it. You can do volume. You can do. Shut your mouth. Yeah. It's a slider. No wonder they're so damn quiet. It's a slider for volume. Uh, There's an infinity to loop it. And then if you click on the name itself, it's what makes it play. Hey, Shaddies. How are you you doing? This is B-Dubs. Oh, oh, sorry. That was super loud. Hi, folks. This is Lewis Herfin, the original Peter Abernathy. Hell is empty and all the devils are here on the Shadow TV What For Podcast with Roger, Gene, and Big D. Welcome back to Shad on TV Westworld, the unofficial podcast companion piece of the hit HBO series Westworld. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me is my co-host, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And this is our Telegraph edition, where we look back on this week's episode of Westworld and provide our feedback on the top listener email and voicemail for the week. This week's episode was titled Well Enough Alone. It is episode two of season four. And if you haven't listened to The Telegraph before, we are going to go through the top listener emails, top voicemails for the week. But we may not read the entire email because some of them are quite lengthy. All of the emails that we receive are posted by Big D on the website for you to check out. We'll respond there as well. So we invite you to write in to hosts at shatontv.com with your thoughts or visit us at shatpod.com slash TV and go to the speak pipe feature to leave your thoughts. Yeah. So Gene, we got a message on the website. Somebody said, Hey, I'm here for all the, uh, the emails. Where are they? Did I do something wrong? I responded, no, you would not. I was traveling in Sweden. I could not do them. I added, I think 65 emails to the website yesterday, and I will be adding this entire batch sometime tonight so when you're listening to this podcast they will be there Uh, so go check them out also if you're listening on youtube a few youtube listeners have asked why don't you check youtube for comments as well a couple of reasons one is it's really hard to wrangle all that together we try to keep it in like a, a single funnel but also with youtube comments we don't know if you want us to read that on the podcast or not so it's hard for us to tell so it's a lot easier if you just write in or call in with a voicemail and this week's emails and voicemail cover christina Maeve, flies and the tones that people are hearing, the different seasons and writers of Westworld, the new park, and a few other topics. But we'll get started with the topic of Christina. And our first voicemail comes from Mike J. Hall in the UK. Hi, y'all. It's Mike from London here. Uh, Some thoughts and observations from me. What if the Christina storyline we are seeing in season four is in fact a prequel to season one? And it's showing how the storylines for the non-playable characters in Westworld came about. Maybe Delos acquired uh, her current company. Uh, We've seen her write a storyline similar to Dolores's and the Man in Black's, uh, where it's the poor schmuck who lost everything and drowned his sorrows for a girl. That's why Dolores looks like Christina, in homage to her storyline's creator. I'm not sure where that would take us for the rest of the season, so maybe not. I did notice when um, Christina is walking uh, with her roommate on way to her date, a restaurant in the background is called Pinch Salt. So maybe the show is telling us we can't believe anything we see or hear. And her roommate says, take a look at this world. Nobody wants easy or natural. Art is a lie that tells the truth. I have no idea what any of this means. I just (laughs) thought it was interesting. Uh, Great to have you back on the airwaves. Love you, bye. Uh, love the voicemail. And it, it got me thinking, yes, I agree. I think that the, this could be early, like before the park, they're building all of the narratives. And the way that we can tell, I believe that whether or not we're right or wrong, if we ever hear a mention in the NYC world of the rebellion of the war, because we've seen in the Caleb Mave time, it's memorialized. It's almost like a new 4th of July. It's like in Uh, the leftovers, when they remember when everybody disappeared, and they reference the war. If we don't hear that in NYC, I think it's either it hasn't happened or it was way in the past. I don't want to say I'm endorsing what Mike is saying here because I'm easily swayed by the English because they sound smart. But we do see companies do this all the time, right? Companies will purchase smaller companies. Meta does it all the time, right? They'll, they'll buy a smaller company because they want one particular piece of its technology or some sort of IP. It could be the simple fact that Delos purchased the narratives or the video game technology as a core power of Westworld. I like it. Yeah, and I think that the one of the core cornerstones of Dolores is her, is her view of the world as being beautiful and that she's a creator. She liked to paint. As a narrator developer in the video game, it is a perfect transition. All of her stories are about her father, and she's searching. 
I would love that we're seeing who the real Dolores was, but fingers crossed. Next up, we have a voicemail from Steve, who has a much darker take on Christina's story. Hey, Shaq crew. It's Hunt Fuss Steve. Just finished the episode of Westworld. So I haven't listened to your Instacast or anything yet, but a couple of things. Fuck, William is still alive. Wow. That was a pretty big shock. Thought he was dead. Um, also, I so back in Watchmen, I called in early or emailed, I don't remember, and I was, like, very adamant that statue is Ozzy Mandia's, like, the actual person, and I was very much correct about that. Um, I'm having the same feeling Christina's roommate is Char Loris. I just have a feeling somehow she's Char Loris. It's simulation, probably, so I'm going with my gut on that one, and we'll see if it's right. I uh, can't wait to listen to the Instacast probably tomorrow because it comes out pretty late or Monday. But uh excited to hear it. Glad you guys are back on TV. Um, that's how I originally found you for Game of Thrones. So have a great night. I get the feeling that Steve is pushing for us to come up with a chat version of Reddit's karma. And he's already claiming he wants some karma points for that Osmandius thing. I mean, he did fund like one third of Shatha movies last season. So I guess uh, we could, yeah, we'll give you some karma, Steve. But I do want to say one thing here. And I know Gene hates these crazy theories, but that's why I'm here. I'm going to dive headfirst into the nonsense. If Christina is the base for Dolores, right? The roommate has to be the base for another character. Do you think who could it be? Who in the Westworld world was like the friend of Dolores? Who would it be who kept her in line? I mean, you would say Bernard, but but Bernard is based on Arnold. So, I mean, I don't, I don't see the, the lines there. I mean, I think this is – I don't know if this one holds water. Oh, I'm, I'm going with Maeve. Ma- Maeve and Dolores were never friends. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just doubling up the tinfoil. All right. Next up, we have a voicemail from Matt who's got a totally different idea on Christina. Hey, Shaq crew. Matt from San Diego. First time, long time couple thoughts related to Dolores after hearing Ash talk about her being the potential savior and hero for this season. Theory number one, we know that Dolores took Teddy's Pearl and shot him into the Valley Beyond after the hosts entered the Valley Beyond on their own. Is it possible that when she made copies of herself to take back to the mainland, the real world in season two, that she made another copy of herself and inserted it into the dream, excuse me, into the sublime. I know that there was a theory floating that perhaps what we're seeing with Christina is the sublime. And if that is the case, is it possible that Dolores created a version of herself, a copy rather, maybe a base copy that would allow her to somehow find her way back to the center of the maze, but in the sublime? It would would explain why Teddy exists, if that is truly the true Teddy. So that's theory number one. I'm going to send another message here with theory number two. Well... I'm going to address theory number one, though. Okay, so when we saw the Valley Beyond and they all walked out there, it was just undeveloped land. And we assume they still have the mentality of the people of the Old West. We now see them in New York. They either, what, quickly developed technology and built the world into NYC? Like, I think that would have taken thousands of years of virtual development in order to get there. I think it's more likely the other way around that the NYC created what we saw later. Now, I did touch on this topic a little bit, uh, I think last week, where what we have to consider, though, is inside of a computer, inside of a simulation, uh, things could happen a lot faster, right? So yeah. if we if we consider the sublime as a digital landscape, time may pass differently there. So there could be something there. It would be very interesting that they built exactly a New York City, but I wouldn't rule it out. Agreed. Thanks, Matt, for your voicemail. Uh, Moving on from Christina to Maeve, we've got another voicemail from Mike in Mass. Uh, Part two of my message, Mike from Mass again. Um, Delertina, that's what I'm calling Dolores and Christina. She's Delertina to me. Um, When she is waking in the bed, it matches the images we had from a previous series where uh, 
previous uh, um, seasons where, you know, it shows that she's in her loop. And last season, Caleb did that all the time. They showed him multiple times, but then they didn't say whether he was a host. So is he a host also? And Delertina's boss recounts um, her pitch of Peter's story before she thinks about it matching Peter. And when she finishes the story, loses his job, gets depressed, and she says, and everyone dies. I thought that was very ominous. When Maeve is in the cabin meditating or remembering, she causes a power outage in the town. Is this a field of energy she's absorbing or emitting since she's off the grid and you can see that with a generator there? And she knows she caused the outage because she lies about it when she goes to the general store. So what kind of a twist is that on her power? And speaking of which, when William visits Clem and he says, where's your old master, Maeve? I have to question, how can that possibly be? Oh, all right, next episode. <laughs> well, I, I do question the power outage because if you've seen the Sonic, the new movies, that's that's how Sonic gets caught. As Sonic gets a bit fired up, he gets a bit excited. He starts running the bases. Boom, big blue energy. And that's how he gets caught. It is odd that she would all of a sudden have this new power and not have sensed she was about to go critical, but it seems like maybe this could be used as an offensive weapon, but yeah, it would be dangerous for her that she can't hide anymore. We saw in season one that the hosts, at least the older ones, used a sort of a mesh network uh, to communicate with each other, and that's how Maeve was able to control hosts in season two as well. Um, so it's possible that she's just refining that gift. I mean, it is very Jedi Knight, as Ash has said. And I would almost guarantee that we get some scene like a Stranger Things where there will be a big climactic scene where she has to unleash that EMP sort of power again. Also, listeners, if you're wondering about Matt's multi-part voicemails and Mike's, uh, kudos to both these guys, because I think Matt laid down like six of them and Mike was like two or three of them. But we do appreciate everyone using that speak pipe feature and uh, limiting their voicemails to a minute 30. Yeah. So Matt and Mike, I think we're going to we're going to bump up the time a little bit to give you guys, if you're recording a couple extra seconds so you could restart it so that you don't have to call back with seven different ones. But one thing I want to address and Gene, maybe we could talk about this quickly is the Clementine issue. We see her in episode two in the opening. She's living her best life. She's colorful. She's happy. She's looks like she's somewhere in South America. She then gets taken over. Is she like reprogrammed, repurposed? Because it would be hard if you if you're Char Loris and you want to promote, you know, freedom and free will. That does not look like a choice that Clementine had gone from being happy to being now some form of slave assassin. Would they be forcing reprogramming, or what do you think? I don't want to get into tinfoil here, but when we <laughs> see William encounter Clem at the beginning of episode two, we don't know what that time frame is and we don't know which William that is. It's possible that when he's referring to her master, he's actually talking about her host master, Char Loris, if you will. And that is William who has escaped. Wow. I, I, I tried to bait you into some tinfoil and you did a good job of dodging it. Fuck. Good work. Next up, we have an email from the commissioner of I'm Gonna Get You Sucka on Shat the Movies, our sister podcast. It's Black Girl Couch, and she's writing in about Maeve's dialogue. Black Girl Couch says, I rather enjoyed the dialogue. Maeve is a scripted host whose primary narrator was Lee Sizemore. Sure, the host can grow, but they're bound by the idiosyncrasies we all grow up learning, and thus, she felt more like the brothel madam in this episode than she has in a long while. In proposition, rather than Maeve irrationally turning Caleb into a host regarding the flashbacks, the showrunners are alluding to an intimacy rather than a mystery, but time will tell. P.S. Missed Ash on the I'm Gonna Get You Suck a podcast. P.S.S. It's my crack ship and I'm ship if I want to. Hashtag Maleb. Signed, Black Girl Couch, who also happens to be named Christina. I'm a host. I, I'm going to start dropping darling into the middle of every podcast so I can, I can be like Maeve. She's had seven years alone. In that time, she's she, she's talking to. So maybe she's reverting back to her like core personality. I like that. But what happened at the lighthouse? We we joked on the deep dive that it had to have been sex, but it could have been something more. It could have been that. I mean, do we talk about what we've seen on the like the trailers for the new episodes? Because some people don't like it. Not if you ask Ferdinand. I, I feel like I'm the only one paying attention here. 
during our preview for season yeah, four, true. we, we clearly that's, said that's if true. HBO releases it, it's fair game. Okay, good. So I'm going to go that way. So in one of the on the you know in this season, we see that it looks like Caleb's got like a chest wound, and Maeve is leaning over him. What if he is he's going to die, and she gives him the option? Hey, I can either help you out here. We can transfer you. We can do something to save you. That's what happened at the lighthouse. It's not sex, and sex is just some kind of a red herring. I don't know. I like to wait and see. I'm a wait and see kind of guy. Next up, we have an email from Ramon about Maeve. And Ramon writes, hey, Shaq crew, longtime listener, first time writer. You mentioned in the Instacast for episode two, why would Charloris want to bring Maeve to the park? I think they need Maeve, not only for her superpowers, but I think she's the only one that can access or understand the map. Could also go along the lines that you mentioned about the hive mind, since she can control hosts. Well, they might want to use that power to hive mind all the hosts out there in the real world. I'm sure you guys can word it better than I can. Anyway, thanks for the pod. You guys don't know how much they mean to us. Been listening since Westworld Season 1, Episode 1. Oh, and add Ash's name to the description on Spotify. Still shows some Roger guy, whoever that is. Thanks, Ramon. So I think there's two options on why you invite or try to lure Maeve into the park. We've seen that William has upgraded the hosts to try to make them more resistant. And I'm going to just give the analogy of like a, a software program, right? You, you either try to harden it or you're trying to hack it. So William could either be luring her as a way to hack the pearl and try to get the, the encryption key or figure out what are the limits of her power? How can I protect my new drones? so that she can't have power over them anymore. I like it. Moving on from Maeve, we've got another prolific email from Gillian, this time talking about the tones mentioned in episodes one and two. And Gillian writes, regarding the tones, the tones and the tower are linked together. In season one, they use the song reveries to calm Maeve down after her daughter is killed by the man in black. Ford says, quote, an old trick from an old friend. The song was supposed to calm and relax her, but because she was conscious or close to it, Maeve managed to break free of the song's control and stab herself in the neck. In season one, Peter Abernathy sees a photo of Juliet, and his response is supposed to be, doesn't look like anything to me, but he begins to question the photo because he was close to consciousness. So if the song reveries controlled you and you couldn't see the things that could hurt you, you were a fully functioning host. In the New York City pop-up in, in real world, some of the hosts, when you were checking out, would turn the tablet for you to answer this question. If you answered yes, your profile was flagged for further observation. Additionally, as discussed, when the tones played, the hosts would glitch. If a human sees the tower, they are no longer programmed. If a human hears the tones, they are no longer programmed. So short answer, season one, Controlled hosts respond to musical cues. Controlled hosts cannot see that which will hurt them. Conscious hosts will not respond to music, as Maeve still kills herself even with the music playing. Conscious hosts will see what they're not supposed to, as Peter Abernathy did with the Juliet photo. In season four, fly-controlled humans hum the tone. Fly-controlled humans cannot see a giant looming tower. Fly-controlled humans cannot hear the tone. Uncontrolled humans can hear the tone uncontrolled humans can see the tower uncontrolled humans do not hum the tone so far i can only confirm one human was humming after flies and another thing on the tones you can actually hear it in the background music during the first scene in episode one after the cartel man was infected with the flies you hear it when he kills his family and fellow cartel members and when he walks the bridge to give william the keys to the dam You can also hear the tone very low when Christina is talking to the homeless man and when she's in the mental hospital. You can also hear the tones when Maeve and Caleb are approaching the human Mrs. Whitney. The background music is the tone to a certain degree, and like a dog whistle, every time I hear the very low tones, I assume it's a clue that we're now looking at a fly-controlled human. And that comes from Gillian. I, I, I love her emails, by the way. She, like, like This is just a taste. Go to the website and read this whole thing. So here's an option. The hosts only know the world in which they were created and lived up to this point. We see that they want to replace humans and to become the God. 
are they trying to replicate the world and the way that they functioned into the humans? Is that why they're trying to implement music? I don't disagree with what Gillian's saying. I think that these are these are very big clues. Just so we saw the visual clues with widescreen versus letterbox. I think that there is an auditory clue that is there. My suspicion is that it's a very simple world domination sort of a plot line. It doesn't have to necessarily do with host cognition, just a parallel of the way that they were controlled, kind of saying that music is the key. Yeah, I just, I just hope it's not a simple case that like the, the homeless guy is, is mentally ill and that's why the music and the messages don't function on him. This is like another one of the 12 monkeys thing. Like the, the people who were truly different weren't affected by the virus. And maybe here, the mental institution, him on the street and the birds, they all have something in common to where their, their brains are functioning different and the control method doesn't work. Well, thank you, Gillian, for your email as always. And definitely do go check out her email on shatpod.com slash TV. There is a lot more to it. Next up, we have an email from John G also writing in about the flies and John writes, Hey guys, first of all, thank God. Big D is back. He always dives face first with joy (laughs) into this show. And I love him for it. Something you guys said on the deep dive made me think of something I hadn't considered. I was curious about how the flies seem to not make good human sleeper agents. They seem to be sweating and struggling and eventually going insane and longing for death. But what if the actual purpose of the flies is to capture the mind of the person, like the hats did in Westworld, only it does it much faster and in the process it destroys their brain? But that goo can then be read by some technology to recreate the person in a host body. So you don't need 30 years at the park anymore to capture that. And Maeve and Caleb not taking the hats in the park isn't the protection they think it is. What if Hale doesn't need the forged data at all? She's been getting something much better on her own with this goo stuff. Because if you think about it, who are the hosts? When Hale talks about her children, what does she mean? What would freedom to be who they are mean for a host? The ones made in the park have been created for park narratives. Even as possibly the freest host in the world right now, Maeve is still talking and acting like the person she grew up being at the saloon. All the hosts in the sublime, who they are, was so shaped by life in the park. If Hale wants to create a new world for her children where they can be who they want to be, how do you create those people? As humans, we get the DNA from both parents and then we build up through experiences in the world, but start with a genetic blueprint. A brand new host could be a completely blank slate, or it could start with some kind of baseline. So perhaps what Hale is doing is taking all the minds from the people she captures with flies and creating some sort of big mix of minds and personalities to combine into narratives so the host can start somewhere and then build their unique identities and selves out of. And perhaps that's the storyline that Dolores slash Christina is living in, creating new narratives out of real narratives from the humans in a park where the host can develop who they are. And that comes from John G. We we get from Anastasia. She comes down the stairs, the real Anastasia, the, the senator's wife, and she says, I had this really weird dream. So she's been infected before the double comes out. If you're going to create a duplicate, whoever it is, the, the senator, the wife, you need their memories. You need, we're going to assume that both of them weren't in the park in Westworld. So how do you create a believable clone? And the flies would give you a method to do that. Maybe it's a quick download. And as a result, like you said, it does something adverse to the mind, but you can't just simply clone Gene Lyons without your experiences, without your knowledge and throw you into work. They would know right away. They'd be like, Gene, you look like Gene, but you're don't have his memories, his knowledge. You don't know where his office is. You don't know where his car is. You don't know where he lives. You have to find a way to transfer that and the flies might do it. Next up, we have an email from a writer who is asked to remain anonymous. And it says, first off, thank you for doing the podcast. Doing one podcast a week would be a lot of work, let alone three. I have a couple of thoughts I want to share about season four in general. The flies in this show this season remind me of parasites that infect and control an animal's behavior. For example, the fungus that infects the brain of carpenter ants and controls them in a way that ensures the fungus's survival over that of the ant survival. Another less direct example would be toxoplasmosis, which cats spread. While it can have an effect on people, it's been shown to make mice less afraid of cats, which makes it easier for the cats to catch the mice. The flies in season four crawl into the eyes of people, and then those people are controlled by what I assume are the hosts. 
either the people can be controlled on the fly, pun intended, remotely and in real time by the hosts or the desired behaviors are programmed in the fly ahead of time. So once they infect a person, that person immediately acts according to a program. The opening sequence shows a fly being created. My theory is that the hosts, most likely Charlotte, are creating the flies to control people. Certain callbacks are made to previous seasons, but in a way that seems inverted from when they were originally used. For example, in episode two, Man in Black is told his purpose is to be the loser, an inversion of what he told Teddy back in season one. If my theory is correct, that's another inversion. The hosts are now programming the behaviors of humans. In season two, we learned that the hosts were being used to decode humans. I get the sharp impression that that is being inverted in season four, and humans are being used to decode hosts. This email does bring up an interesting question, which is how are they being controlled? And I like that you laid out a couple different options on that, Anonymous. Is there, Does a host need to be nearby pulling the strings like a marionette? Or is each fly pre-coded with a program that the human must execute? Now, I would lean toward the former because we see the man in black, William, in episode one at the Hoover Dam. He seems to be clearly controlling Hugo to do the killing and then kill himself. But you do wonder, is it verbal commands? Is it remote commands? How does it all work? Well, he actually does say, have I completed my mission? So there is a verbal component to it, but to me, just swarms are so much more terrifying. The idea of a thousand flies chasing you is much worse than a giant robot, something big that you can't escape like nanobots. What about the age old question, Big D, would you rather fight a chicken every time you get in your car or fight a chimpanzee with a sword once a year? Oh, I, I, I could kill a. Ch- I've killed chickens before. I could kill a chicken pretty easily. You just pop its head off really quick. But the chimpanzee—that's scary. They—they they have like really. They're really strong, and they, they could rip your face off. It's a good answer. Moving on from the flies and the tones, let's get to the seasons and the writers. And we have another voicemail this time coming from B Dubs. Hey, Shaddies, how are you doing? This is B Dubs. Instead of delving into the minutia of each episode, I prefer to take a step back and judge the body of work so far in season four. This is a show that I have loved in the past, and I wish that I could love it now, but I don't know. The inconsistent writing, a growing list of B-level talent, and the lack of clear direction are making it very difficult. Uh, Let me know what you think about this. I mean, do we need to face reality that this is just a visually stunning show but has so much plot confusion that uh, it's time to move on? You know, when I watch those uh, post-show clips, I'm convinced the writers have a sense of such grandiosity that they are so full of themselves that they forgot to write for the most important people, the audience. What do y'all think? Uh, I don't know. I think you got to also remember HBO is the one who does that whole behind the scenes. Yes, they have creative control of it, but you're you're not going to come out there and make it look like you haven't thought things out and you haven't really put in all the effort, and that's going to come across as arrogant. I mean, there's a lot of times that both Ash and I have gotten, oh, you guys are pompous. You guys are, and we're not. It's just that's kind of the way it comes across. I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a tough thing. You're, you're not going to go on a, hey, we spent a year developing this project, but yet we didn't put our effort into it and didn't really think it through. So I'm willing to cut them some slack. B-dubs, I agree with you that they are insufferable on those clips. And so I just stopped, <laughs> I just stopped watching them because I can't handle it. It makes me like the show less. But one thing to keep in mind is when I read people's criticism of season three, especially when people say on like Facebook, when they're responding to Westworld and they say, I stopped watching this in season two or season three because it was crap. I get defensive. I get defensive because I'm like, it's not that bad. And if I were watching the show for leisure, I'll admit I would have stopped watching it. But one of the benefits I think of doing the podcast is we watch the whole thing in its entirety. And usually upon reflection, I feel like the body of work as a whole, once the season is over, is always stronger than its individual parts. Agree. And and the friends and family that I deal with who are like, oh, I gave up on season two. It's because this type of show requires more than just casual watching. You can't put it on in the background and do the dishes or fold clothes or whatever you're going to be doing and think you're watching the show. It takes thought and you have to be able to look at a whole season and put the arc back together, whether season two or three that are disjointed and and nonlinear, 
it's easier for people to watch Ozark and be like, huh, he's laundering money. Oh, huh, he's going to kill that guy. It's harder to be like, well, that's not really Bernard. That's Arnold. And this was before he scrambled his mind. And this is years before. That takes effort. And I think viewers are also lazier today. Just an apology to Ozark viewers, electricians, and Buddhists on behalf of Big D. <laughs> Next up, we have a voicemail from Jonathan from Vegas. Hey, guys. Jonathan from Vegas again. Just chiming in. I don't know if anyone notices, but the vice president show happens to be the same geeky age from Con Air, a movie that I think you guys reviewed uh, that, get, that gets killed. Gene, you're awesome. You're in Phoenix. I'm in Vegas. It'd be great to meet up and talk with you because I think we're pretty similar guys. Oh. Big D, I think it's important, like you said, for everyone to watch Future World because it's kind of an element that is kind of important of the replacement of government. And when you replace leadership and control, that I think is what Sir Lawrence is kind of saying about growing for babies. Ed Harris leaked the fifth season in an interview with the Hollywood Reporter, filming in April and May of next year. Like I mentioned, it's a five season arc of this show. It was already written before the editing. There are things that if you go back to the first season, just like they end up starting to make sense later. And I think the overall goal is to have a park like Christina's in where the hosts are guests. And the humans are the hopes from the beginning, kind of wrapping the circle. So, Gene, if you do go see Jonathan in Vegas and he tries to lure you into an opera house and to go down <laughs> into a tunnel and onto a, a, a railway car, be very careful because he this could be a trap. I'll be sure to wear my best tuxedo uh, while I'm in Vegas for the Morrissey concert this weekend. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for for calling in. I do love a five season show. I think that's 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 just the right amount when you've got something like this, when it's like a sprawling drama. Some things like comedies don't necessarily need to go that long. Like a, like a Ted Lasso, five seasons would just be absolute torture. Stranger Things also does not even need four seasons. Should have really been done at one. But I think it, I think the show does deserve five seasons. And when we talk about that, especially because we've only got eight episodes this season, there's just no way you wrap up this epic tale in six more episodes. It, it wouldn't be enough to tell the story. The numbers are pretty consistent between episode one and two. Very little change. It's it's down big time from you know the pinnacle of Westworld in season one and two. I just hope that Westworld does not pull the plug. They almost did it with the leftovers, and it took a bunch of fans going to New York and protesting outside their offices as the guilty remnant to stand outside. If we need to, you know, cowboy up and go down to to the offices in New York as a group here to get them to do season five. The only way I'll be disappointed is if you don't give us a conclusion. Thank you so much for your voicemail, Jonathan. Discount Don is back again this week with another gem of an email. And he writes, hey, folks, Discount Don here. Have you ever dreamed of being a superhero fighting an epic villain for the fate of the universe? Maybe you wanted to go to wizard school, learn the art of magic. What about interact with real dinosaurs? Well, when you have caviar taste, but a hamburger budget, Come to Delos. Why be a warlord when you can visit America in the 1920s, where if you were white and rich, it was the best of times? Why fight a T-Rex when you can fight tuberculosis? Trade in a Patronus for polio. Cross the Atlantic with Charles Lindbergh, offer not available to certain religions. Ride in open automobiles that travel as fast as 18 miles per hour. <laughs> Woo, slow down there, Ethel. There is no end to the fun you can have. Here at Delos, we are a family-friendly park, so bring the kids. The little <laughs> ones will have fun breaking up a suffragette rally or turn those water hoses on those minority protests. That's right, Tommy. Spray them good. Yes, sir. The 1920s is the place to be. You schedule early, and you'll be entered in a raffle for the actual Iron Lung. Man, give me an annual pass. I want to I wanna go. I want to I get out of the, the car with Ethel and go 18 miles an hour. I love it. Discount on. The only thing that can make this better is making this a voicemail. You got to get you got to get the old timey uh, music in the background. Make it happen, man. Because if you don't, I will. Oh, great. 
And from Discount Don, we move to Black Box, who's calling back for a second week with a voicemail. What's going on, Shaq Crew? It's Black Box again. I am thoroughly confused with almost everything that's going on, but I would like to personally call out the showrunners for the most egregious oversight in the history of the show. While the man in black is hitting back-to-back-to-back holes in one, he's using a driver on a par three. I can't even stand the show anymore. Well, Black Box, I'm, I'm going to take this a level, level deeper, right? So vi- the vice president's there. William's trying to intimidate him. Maybe he was intentionally using a driver on the first shot to be like, hey, look at this shit. Driver, boop, hole in one. Oh, you didn't see that one? Oh, I'm going to do it again. Boop, a hole in one again. He was trying to basically you know, intimidate the vice president, make him realize that he was more than human. Maybe being a driver was a subtle way to be like, pay attention to the details. Also, he didn't use a wedge or a putter. He used a driver to show that he is in control of the situation. Yeah. I think it would have been better if he had a putter. If he was out there whacking it with a putter, that first shot, the vice president would have been on him right away. You, a putter? What are you? And anybody who watches that new LIV golf, the Saudi golf or whatever, what? Phil Mickelson dresses exactly like the man in black. He's wearing all black. He's playing the villain. So hefty lefty looks like a bigger version of William. By the way, some people have been asking how old Ed Harris is and asked if he was older than Betty White. The man is 71. He's not that old. He's just got some sun. That's all. Thanks, Black Box, for your voicemail. Next up, we have an email asking us to please stop watching and referring to the trailers. And Ferdinand writes, Gene, Ash, and Big D. I love your podcast, but I must ask you to stop referring to things from the trailers. Many of us do not watch the trailers so as to not have anything spoiled. I absolutely do not want to know anything about what is coming up in the next episode. Also, let us realize that a trailer is a promo. Its purpose is to persuade someone to watch an episode. For those of us who know that we are going to watch, the trailers are not meant for us. A viewer only gets one chance to see an episode for the first time. Please do not do anything to diminish that experience. For that reason, I must ask you to stop making any mention of things that you've seen in the trailers. More fundamentally, I would suggest that you not watch the trailers. That signed Ferdinand in New York. I feel like Ferdinand wants me to start humming some music. Like he's doing some mind control there. Like I'm losing my free will. I'll tell you, I love to please everyone. And when I first read this, I was like, oh, he's right. You know, we we, we shouldn't do that. We should protect it. You know, we, we should keep Fernand's like knowledge pure. But you're right. The the vast majority watch it. You're, you're not listening to this podcast if you don't want to brainstorm, think about possibilities, know what's coming without cheating and searching for spoilers. So I think a majority of our audience wants it and listens to it. And, and it was part of our you know, five things that we agreed to, Gene, in the opening. So I think we we have to do it. Yeah, and Ferdinand actually asked us to do this on YouTube as well. So I appreciate your tenacity there, Ferdinand. I actually generally don't watch the trailers. I, I finished watching the episode and I immediately got to get in and start doing the Instacast stuff. And so I don't typically watch them. But it is clearly stuff that HBO wants us to see ahead of time. And if you think about it, where do you draw those boundaries? For instance, Westworld has a website. They've shown that they want us to be on their website and check things out. They have live action events, right? Whether it's in the High Line in New York, your hometown, Ferdinand, or whether it's in Austin, they're trying to give us hints. I mean, for God's sake, Teddy Flood, biggest spoiler of the season. They did that at a public event intentionally. And so I appreciate what you're saying here. And I totally respect your desire to not have us reference the trailer. So I I will make you this pledge that if we're going to reference something on the trailer, we will clearly say, and we saw this on the trailer and then give you the opportunity to skip past that. Yeah, I'll say Ferdinand, earmuffs, earmuffs. Yeah. And finally, we've got an email from Bill C who's asking about House of the Dragon. He says, hi, Shad on team. I've really been enjoying your Westworld podcast. Will you be doing a new podcast for the House of the Dragon show coming in August? If yes, will it be on the same feed as Game of Thrones? Thanks, Bill C. So, Bill, I, we've addressed it before, but I think we we want to address it again here. We would love to. 
But as people with full-time jobs and families, it's nearly impossible. If you guys knew the schedule that we're pulling here with three adults, with families, significant others to record movies, three episodes a week for this, the research, the rewatches, I'm recording this right now. And my wife has just grilled up the most beautiful salmon that I've seen. They're eating and I'm sitting here with Gene recording. We make sacrifices and it puts a lot of pressure. If we could duplicate ourselves, yes. But unfortunately, as amateur, a lot of people like to point out, you guys are amateurs. We are amateurs. It is physically impossible for us to do it, even though we would love to. Yeah, I mean, and that extends to Fourth of July weekend. I mean, Fourth of July weekend was recordings, recordings, recordings. Big D, uh, you know, you just flew back from Sweden and had to like get back off the flight, watch the movie for this week, and then watch both episodes, get all caught up on everything. And like you said, it was like getting on a treadmill that's going 20 miles per hour. Yeah, so we would love to, but unfortunately, it's not within our bandwidth, so... Thanks for writing in, Bill. Thanks to everyone who wrote in and called in this week. That concludes this week's episode of Shout on TV Westworld Telegraph. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shout on TV. On Facebook, just search for Shout on TV Podcasts. The website is shatpod.com slash TV. You can email us your ideas at host at shoutontv.com. Again, if your email does not make the podcast, it might make it in a future week. It'll definitely make the website. So check it out there and we will respond. And if you'd like to leave that voicemail, again, shatpod.com slash TV, go to the SpeakPipe feature. We love that audio quality. We love how many of you guys have been sending in. It's really, really fantastic. I think it's working out great. And Big D is going to look into taking the time limit up a little bit from 90 seconds. Mm-hmm. So you have a little bit more time to talk. Wherever we're fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co hosts Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us Sunday for the Westworld Instacast.